gala dinners are one of the staples of the event planning industry. Chances are that you will have worked at this sort of event at some point in your career. I know I did a huge number of these over the years, both as a technician and as a technical planner and designer. Most gala dinners tend to follow a similar format. There will be some form of a seated dining area, a stage for speeches and live entertainment, a dance floor, and some form of a bar area for after dinner drinks. As you can see, my venue model is fairly complete, and I've already used the 2D drawing tools to define the rough areas for my gala layout. Spotlight has a range of tools and features to aid your event design and planning process. Since today's focus is data and how to use it for event planning, I'm not going to go through all of them in detail. I'll be focusing on the seating section tool and how to adapt its workflow for data-driven design. If you want to find out more about the rest of the event planning tools and features or any part of Spotlight, check out the Vectorworks University. Now, before I go any further, I want to quickly talk about objects and the data attached to them. All the objects in a Spotlight file have data. It doesn't matter whether it is a simple symbol from the library or a parametric object like a seating section or a lighting device. This data can be generated in many ways. It can be part of a data record attached to the object, or it can be based on the object's locational parameters. The important thing to remember is that no matter how the data is generated, you can edit and work with it. And most importantly, use it to aid your design process. Okay, the first thing I need to do now is lay out my table and seating plan. Since I already created rough uh, boundary objects for the seating uh, plan areas, I'm just going to reuse these as the basis for my table plan. As you can see, I have here an already prepared seating section style, which uses a custom table symbol, which I'll go into more detail about in a minute. And this saves me time since I only need to fill out the section name and starting table number for each section. So before we go any further, let's have a look at the customized table symbol for my layouts. As you can see, I've already customized it. It's got some place settings and an image prop centerpiece added to it. And most importantly, I've removed all the seats from it. The reason I've separated the chairs out from the table symbols is to make sure I can access the data records attached to them. Whenever you create a seating section, the resulting object or seating section object blocks access to the individual data records attached to the chairs and tables contained inside that seating section. So instead, I've created a chair group symbol that can be inserted after the tables are placed, which can then be safely ungrouped without breaking the seating section itself. I did this by cutting the chair symbols out of the original table symbol, like I'm doing here, pasting them into a design layer, and converting them into a group by using the convert to symbol command with the group option turned on. This gets me the best of both worlds. Very quick table layout using the seating section tool and the ability to add data to the individual chairs that can now be accessed and used by the Spotlight data tools during my planning process. Before I insert my chairs, there's one last thing I need to do. I have to add the chair numbers inside the group. So the quickest way to do this, that I've found at least, is to use the Spotlight numbering tool to edit either the 2D or 3D components of the group which is accessed in the context menu in the resource manager. One thing that you need to remember here if you choose to go down this route is that if you change the symbols inside the group symbol, that will reset their data records back to the default from the library. So that if you've already got them in your design and you change the symbol, you could lose a lot of data. So you have to be careful about how you handle this. Now, to get the most out of these chair group symbols, over time, I've created my own database of commonly available chairs, are stocked by my local rental companies. I did this by creating a workgroup library folder for the chair symbols. And then whenever I used a new supplier, I would save the customized chairs into this library. This means that a lot of the basic data is already present in the chairs when I import them into an active project. This saved me from having to look all this up and add it into the symbols every time I did a new project. I'll start inserting the chairs. The important thing here is that I insert the chairs in the order that the tables are numbered. I don't think you need to see all of them getting inserted, so I'll jump forwards. 
Now that the chairs are all inserted, I need to add the event-specific data, such as table numbers that each chair group is associated with, who is sitting where, meal choices, and so on. To do this, I need to ungroup the chairs so they're directly accessible. I have a safe view on my template that's set up to help me with this. Only the chairs are fully visible and the tables are set to gray so that I can see the table numbers. There are two ways that you can insert the table numbers. The first is to manually select the chairs around each table and add the table number in the data pane. This works fine for smaller events, but I prefer to use a worksheet for larger events, which brings me to the second method. Because I inserted the chair groups in the same order as the tables are numbered, they will be in the same order in the worksheet. So I can enter the table numbers far faster this way, either by just typing or using copy and paste. In this case, I prepared an Excel spreadsheet and a very simple Excel function allows me to populate the table numbers in groups of six rapidly. And I can just copy and paste this straight into my worksheet and uh, I'm ready to go. That's my basic table data entered. And I'm now prepared for dealing with my client's data. And this data set includes uh, who is sitting where and what their meal choices are. As before, I could enter this data manually using Spotlight Numbering or the OIP data pane. But since the client has given me this nice Excel spreadsheet, I'll just copy and paste the data directly into my worksheet, which is both faster and reduces the chances of me making any mistakes. With my seating laid out and the basic event data added, let's have a look at how I can take advantage of Spotlight's data tools to work with this data. First up is live data visualization. Many of you will be familiar with using this as part of your documentation process, but it can be also used in a design layer to help you find problems or gain a better overview or understanding of your project. One of the simplest examples that I like to use is to locate unbooked seats. This is really useful as I get a much better overview of my seating plan than just looking at a spreadsheet and seeing the total number of empty seats. I can see at a glance both how many seats are still empty, but also just as importantly, where they are and how they relate to the event as a whole. For this simple example, I'm gonna set up a data viz to use the object with record criteria and select the event planning record reserved parameter or field to focus on. This only provides two options. Uh, so in this case, I've just got two colors, very simple, apply it. And I can now see where the empty seats are and how they relate to each other. So it gives me a better idea if I can cut tables completely and put guests together uh, on different table groupings to create a better atmosphere in the show. So this is a very, very useful little technique. Another good example for live data visualization is checking the meal choices of the guests. This way I can quickly see what meal choice is associated with each guest and spot where there may be a problem, such as where a guest hasn't chosen their meal type or there's possibly a data entry error. Data tags are up next. Data tags are another great way to leverage design model data. Although primarily designed for use with sheet layers, I can use them to label the objects in my plan and display data directly in my design layers. There's a couple of really big advantages about using data tags. The first is I can customize them to look however I like. So this means I can fit them into my own visual style. The other really nice thing is that the tags can both display data and be used to edit the data they display and push those changes back into the object they're linked to at the same time. So when I combine this with live data visualization, it gives me a very powerful visual workflow for quickly identifying problems in my design and fixing them, or reacting to changes that my clients request. The last thing I want to talk to you a little bit more about is worksheets. Now, individually updating objects in their attached data is not always the most efficient way to work, especially if I need to edit lots of objects quickly. As I showed you a little bit earlier, reports can be used to quickly update objects using spreadsheet style workflows. But I can also do this while working in my design layer and using live data vis to identify what needs to be changed. If I've got the report open, I can then make the change directly in the report and watch it update. 
Another important factor in the current situation is distancing regulations. Many countries around the world still have COVID distancing regulations for events that may need to be complied with when you're laying out your table plans. I could deal with this by using the space settings inside the seating section style to define the distance between the tables. This works very well, but it doesn't give me any visual clues about the spacing in my model or for my documentation. So I prefer to actually add geometry into the table symbols. To do this, I will need to add geometry to both the 2D and 3D components of the symbol. It's vital to add it to both parts because the 3D geometry is what defines the spacing uh, inside the seating section. But if I don't add anything to the 2D geometry, then I don't have any good visuals for doing my documentation in top plan mode. Now, in both cases, I'm going to class it so I can control its visibility. This workflow has the advantage that I can see the spacing in my design and avoid having to use the style settings each time. And another useful trick of this method is I can then save these modified table symbols into a library file for different distancing standards. And then if I need to change the plan for a different venue, I can just swap the table symbol out and update the seating section. Staff planning and budgeting is another important part of any event plan, uh, be it a gala or anything else especially if I need to be able to react to any last minute client changes. I found that a good way of dealing with this is to integrate it into your event design. This makes it far easier for me to react to any client changes and enables me to have all my data in a single location so that I can avoid having to go backwards and forwards between different applications while working. So the first step is to create a set of custom symbols for each of the staff roles that are commonly needed. As you can see here, I've already prepared an example in my library. Each is a simple 2D top plan view of a person with the initials of the role added as text. I've also created a custom data record called staff with the fields department, supervisor, ID, and rate, which is attached to these symbols. So to create a new one, all I have to do is duplicate the existing one, update the 2D text, and update the contents of the staff data record. Now I can create a dedicated staff planning layer in my file, and use this for my documentation. Simply place the 2D uh, symbols for each of the roles, add a worksheet, which documents the total staffing costs broken down by hour and eight hour call. And I can also add data of this to this later on. And when any staffing changes take place, I can quickly update the staffing design layer by adding or removing symbols and my documentation will then update as well. And as with the chair symbols, I can use this to create a database that documents my local staffing agencies and their rates for each position by saving variations of these symbols into the separate folders for each company in a workgroup library. Another area that I can leverage the Spotlight data tools is to help me create documentation, providing my crew and clients with easy to understand plans that will help guarantee that the gala runs to budget on the day and that my clients and guests have a great night. So the first thing I'm going to create is a seating plan so that the guests can find their assigned tables. So I'm going to create a sheet layer designed to be displayed on a chalkboard at the event. In this case, I've set it up for A0 paper. I'll create a viewport of a simple 2D top plan view of the table layout along with the room outline, keeping it as simple and as clear as possible. In the annotation layer, I'll add a custom data tag that displays the name of the person assigned to each seat and another to display the table number. I'll also add a data viz to display the seat numbers uh, as a color format. To go with this uh, seating plan, I'm also going to prepare a set of reports to display who is sitting at each table. These are intended to be displayed on another chalkboard near the seating plan. I want to be able to fit each report on an A4 page for printing. This means that I can have a maximum of 55 rows of my database in each report using the default row sizing. And so I estimate that I need roughly eight rows for each table group, since it's six seats a table, plus the headers and column titles. And I also need a double row for the sheet title. So once I take this into account, I'm going to be able to get roughly six uh, tables onto each report and still be able to fit it on an A4 sheet of paper. 
to set this up requires a little bit of work, but it's worth investing it at the start because you can reuse this resource in the future as well. First, I'm going to use the advanced criteria. Top criteria is going to be that uh, the object that is referenced is in the events chairs class, which is part of my standard template again. And then the second will be that the event planning record table number field is set to one. As you can see now, I have six objects uh, that meet this criteria. Now I'll actually set up the columns and the parameters for the report. First column is going to be uh, name, then section, and chair number. I don't need to put the table number in because that's going to be in title of this part of the report. I'm also going to put meal choice and remarks in just in case the guests want to check any of the options. This gives me everything I need for table one. I'm going to add a double uh, height row for the title and another single height row for the table number, as I mentioned earlier. And before I start adding in the next set of database uh, entries, I'm going to do the table header rows for everything else, and I'll leave a single row in for each of the database rows. Now I just keep going in and adding more database rows for each table. Uh, they'll all use the same criteria as I did before. The only difference is that the table number changes with each one. This gets me a report for tables one through six. If I was creating these all from scratch, I would then duplicate this uh, and update the criteria for tables seven through 12, 13 through 18, and so on. However, because this is a fairly standard report that I've used in several productions previously, I'm just going to import the others directly out of my library file where I keep my report templates. And then all I have to do is update them as required. Well, for my last example today, I want to create a meal plan for the catering staff. So I'll duplicate the previous seating plan, change the data tags. This time the data tags will uh, display the meal choice. And I'm going to change the date of this as well. And this time it's going to be a color code uh, for the meal visually. As you can see, my data viz legend currently displays the default meal choices A, B, C, and D. I can quickly change this by editing the annotation and the label legend that the data viz generates. This has the advantage of allowing me to store generic data viz in my workgroup folder and just update it for each event rather than having to create a new one every time. Another very important uh, piece of documentation that you generally have to prepare for most events is some form of fire exit and emergency plan. And while this is not strictly data related, it is very important and often legally required. These can be very easily created in Spotlight using your event design as a starting point. Here I've created a sheet layer with a top plan view of the gala and added the, the emergency escape and exit info into the viewport annotations using a mixture of symbols and, and simple 2D shapes. Because this is a standard part of my event and production planning process, I've also created a custom library of the ISO emergency planning symbols and a specialized title block for the plan.